Hi, everyone. This is Casey Murphy with ACT. We're going to go ahead and get started in just a few moments. Hang tight. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We're just waiting for uh, John Martz to get on here, and then we'll go ahead and get started. For those of you just joining us, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Public Policy Committee call. Uh, if you can just hang tight for a few more moments, I'm just waiting for uh, John Martz to get on the line to go ahead and start the meeting. Thank you. Hang tight, everyone. I'm just going to bring John in now. John, can you hear me? John, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, it was just a little bit of background, no yeah, background noise, but yes, I can hear you clearly now. Yeah, I, I tried to call in by phone, so uh, okay. 
So I, I opened up the laptop. So, okay. All righty. We got uh, we'll, go and, we'll go ahead and get started. We don't have a, uh, don't anticipate a vote today uh, other than to approve minutes. So um, what you have in front of you, if you're looking at the, uh, your laptop and uh, through the webinar with the minutes, so we had an administrative call in February. Primarily, if we do this every uh, January, hopefully it's something, this was February this time. It was just designed to look at policies and procedures and uh, meeting times, conference call times, leadership voting uh, for the following year. And the first thing was um, we looked at the policies and procedures and made a couple of uh, proposed changes that will have to be acted uh, by the board and voted on because uh, these are bylaw changes at the annual meeting. But it, it, one of the things that was, um, I, I think that should be changed is that uh, there's a clause that suggests that the leadership of the committee uh, should just come from the board. And I just think that's a little, ex little too exclusive uh, that uh, even though, you know, I am on the board, that doesn't mean that somebody else couldn't serve in a position of leadership. Like, you know, Jude is on the board, but the rest of the members of the committee or not. And so uh, we, we decided that we should strike that one. So the other one had to do with voting and we, we tried to clarify email voting. Um, if you scroll down a little bit further, you'll, you'll see uh, that that provision requires a quorum uh, and 10 ballots and stuff, but that's consistent. And actually it's a little more specific than the email voting that's allowed by the board for its conference calls. So there was there was that. You want to scroll through the next one? Um, bu 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 the, uh, we elected officers again for this year. Uh, I was nominated for chair. Chrissy Dittmore was nominated for vice chair. And Michelle Landrum was nominated for secretary. Individually, there were votes, and, there, and the three were uh, elected unanimously. Uh, the next thing was we looked at the dates and times for monthly calls. Uh, we will continue to do calls on the second Wednesday of each month at 2 p.m., which is the current practice. Um, uh, that seemed to be convenient for all the voting members, and we've, this has been the traditional time for, gosh, it's been going on almost 10 years now. So that that continues to be viewed as a, as a pretty good and reliable thing. One of the other things we did, we looked at the RFP for uh, the hiring of a uh, or contracting of a consultant lobbyist for government affairs uh, to try and replace uh, uh, Pavlichuk and Associates. The um, suggestions were made, noted in red, forwarded to the executive committee. Uh, they went, were gone over the very next day. Uh, we also nominated six individuals to be on the selection committee. Uh, the executive committee elected to put myself me and Diane Thorne as two of the five who will be on that committee. The others will be Rob Henry, David Strauss, and at this time a yet to be determined member of the board. So that was that. Was that. There was a floor motion uh, regarding hiring or firing responsibilities. There's been some general dissatisfaction with just the fact that uh, uh, our existing government affairs uh, consultant, Jason Pavlichuk, was uh, let go by David and uh, some concern over that. And, this, and the committee registered its dissatisfaction with that. It was a bit of a split vote because of the way the motion was framed. Uh, but uh, essentially, it, was a, it passed 8-6 and two abstentions. And we'll just forward that on to the board because it's just to make a statement. Any um, uh, changes to the minutes that anyone would like to make. Please just use your question box or anything if you do have something that you would like to say. All right, not hearing none and not seeing any. We'll go ahead and ask for approval of the minutes. All those in favor say aye. John, everyone's muted on this one. Oh, well, then. Uh, I don't see it since I don't see any changes and so forth. We'll go ahead and, and and assume those are approved. If anybody else has anything to follow up with, please do so at a later uh, later time by email. And I'm pretty easy to find. Okay, um, you need to open it up for Penny. 
Uh, we're going to let Penny yep. Metten go first and talk about the UBIT situation so she can uh, go off to another meeting. So Penny, I'm going to turn the, the floor over to you. Penny, you should be unmuted now. I'm going to try again, Penny. I have her on mute, John, but. All right, uh, I'll, I'll start and you can try and, and bring Penny in, how's that? Um, okay. One of the issues in tax reform that has caused a, a bit of a problem for our tax exempt members, uh, meaning primarily our nonprofit uh, members like universities, and it has also affects some of the nonprofit hospitals, is the, uh, the tax treatment of the transit benefit uh, becomes taxable essentially for these um, these tax exempt entities. There's what's called the uh, uh, uniform business um, income tax, I guess it is, something like that. UBIT is the initials, but what it boils down to is that certain expenses that uh, a nonprofit entity uh, would make that are not related to their nonprofit purpose, to the purpose of their uh, 501c3 uh, status, or uh, you know the the nonprofit status that they're granted by the IRS. Those things become taxable. So, in the event, uh, let's say uh, in Penny's case um, at UCLA, they offer transit benefits to employees and they subsidize them. Well, all that stuff becomes taxable. So this is, you know, an issue for every one of our universities that provide um, uh, subsidies for their employees. Um, and um, it creates a situation where if we can try and change this, we will do so. But at this point, we do not know if there will be an opportunity before the end of the year. I'm in a real unique position, or was at least, uh, it was canceled earlier today, and it'll probably be redone next week to be at an event where uh, Speaker Ryan was going to be in attendance, and I was going to, my, my question for him from the uh, the peanut gallery, essentially, essentially, was to be, will there be a technical corrections bill? Normally, in the aftermath of a uh, large uh, piece of legislation, such as the tax reform bill that occurred at the end of the year, um, there will be an opportunity to clean things up a little bit. And, and this would be one of the things that would be typical of, of the things to be cleaned up. And we don't know if there's even the will to do this yet. We have some work to do. But um, I suspect the speaker would be reluctant to open that Pandora's box because as so many things happen up here, you, uh, you open the floor for an amendment and the next thing you know um, other things are being lobbed on and one of the things that could easily be lobbed on would be the gas tax increase which of course the speaker is said he's he's against and I'll talk about that in infrastructure stuff in a little bit so uh, I'm not optimistic that we'll get the opportunity but we're certainly going to try so uh, with that uh, I don't have anything more to add to that I don't know if Penny if you've been able to join in uh, or have anything that you'd like to uh, add in through the, through the notes. If you can't call in, please do so. I do, Penny, you are off of mute. You're live if you want to go ahead and speak. She's emailing me telling me that she can hear it, but for some reason she is not able to, we can't hear her. Yeah, there was there was to be a webinar uh, to address the uh, and, and educate some folks as to the UBIT uh, situation um, that was canceled because uh, we need more information before uh, we do that. Uh, as soon as we get that information, we will be convening a webinar to uh, uh, address that issue. Um, if you have if you have members in particular nonprofit tax exempt members who you know are affected by this, please email me 
uh, so I can build a list and contact those individuals and see um, what we can do about this. And, and we'll need their support essentially for anything that we do uh, on the Hill to try and get this done. So unless you want to bring, unless Penny can come back in now, I guess I guess I'm done on this this particular topic for now. Any questions? Yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to chime in on that. I know uh, David Judd. I know you've had uh, you had made a remark. I don't know if you want to uh, jump in on that at all. Uh, they were just talking about what UBIT stood for. Um, I don't know if John, you want to just comment on that. There were a few people who asked what that was. Unrelated business income tax is what the actual things it stands for. It's unrelated business income tax. And Penny just emailed me, John, and said that you need to talk about pre and post tax as we try to figure out her issue here. Um, Pre-tax for employees who elect to uh, with, withdraw the value essentially to buy transit passes or to do vamples or whatever is still uh, non-taxable income, but, but the um, impact uh, of, of subsidization is the one that it's my understanding that is the bigger issue and uh, and that affects a lot of the universities I know Stanford does a lot of subsidization with uh, you know our friend Brian Shaw and uh, and Penny I don't know what else I'm missing here Penny but we'll we'll have an opportunity to bring this forward here at the at the webinar and inform more people how's that I think she's good the only other thing she mentioned was 15b that came out last week for you to talk about that but it's up yeah. to you. Yeah, I'll do that real quick. I, we we included this, and, and there really isn't a lot to say about this because uh, we don't offer tax advice um, here. But the uh, the IRS did release their guide to uh, the um, uh, how the tax treatment uh, for fringe benefits in, in all the various uh, fringe areas. And of course, the qualified transportation fringe benefit is is one of them. So. Uh, Please review that information. Uh, it's, it's fresh off the press. And if uh, you have any questions, feel free to uh, any specific questions that are not related to offering tax advice. Uh, please feel free to email me or call me or David Judd, for example, who's up on this. And again, also, if, if uh, you're a nonprofit, a tax exempt entity, um, you can also chime in with Penny. Uh, in addition to David and myself, and we'll be conferring on, on this issue. And just so you know, John, uh, as well, uh, for everyone's uh, sake here, we do have uh, both the minutes and the uh, tax guide uh, handout uh, underneath the handout section there as a PDF uh, for you to download if you have not already seen either one. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else regarding the uh, Qualified transportation fringe benefit and the challenges we face there. No other messages in the box. Uh, I'll move on to uh, thank thanks Penny for hanging out uh, and trying to get in. Uh, uh, we'll we'll have another opportunity, I'm sure, with this with this webinar to dig into this issue. Oh, uh, we do have. Uh, sorry, uh, David Judd would like to speak. David, you should be unmuted now. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can. Okay. Uh, I just, I have nothing specific to add to what John has said, except for one other thing. And even with publication 15B being out, I've still heard from people who have said they're still reading articles and talking to people who think that Section 132F transit benefit is dead. And I can only reiterate back to any inquiries that, that any members of this committee rumors, questions that you get, 132F is still very much alive. Um, and it's, it's been very tough because there's just a lot of tax experts out there who who don't understand this and read the language and said it's gone. Uh, and I just wanted to put that out in, in case those questions arise and continue to arise. Uh, that's about it. And also, I just want to add that the IRS has said in terms of comments on 15B that they will accept comments but any changes that you see will not take place until 2019, uh, or if Congress mandates any changes. So 
to expect at this point any additional rulings or interpretations on 15b uh i think it's slim to none that you'll see that thanks mm -hmm. very good okay i'll move on to infrastructure which is uh <laughs> an interesting topic this day i'm 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 in dc right now uh, i was here for the national league of cities conference speaking there and and uh there's, there's. If you're if you're watching this, you're, you're seeing uh, very important uh, people in the scheme of things. Whether it's the president, the speaker, the chair of the TNI committee, uh, the environment and public works chairman, and so forth. There's huge disagreement as to what to do on this infrastructure bill and how to fund uh, the infrastructure plan. Um, to the point that uh, there's a stalemate. Essentially, um, right now, it appears that the entire plan is crashed and burned. Now, the opportunity today to revive it, the White House does not want to revive it, and they did something that's pretty unprecedented. There's a, there's a uh, Senate Commerce Committee was having a hearing today, and five cabinet secretaries from the DOT, Commerce, Labor, Agriculture, and Energy, all were going to be speaking on the infrastructure proposal at the Senate Commerce Committee meeting. Now, I was not able to go to that, so I can't tell you anything about it, but we'll probably see something about that in the news, and we'll fill you in as much as we can on this, uh, uh, hopefully before the next uh, conference call. But, um, the topics essentially, you know, were to be, you know, infrastructure with them, also uh, local and state transportation. Uh, since the NLC is here, they're they're on the hill uh, all day. This is, of course, the uh, the small city mayors primarily, and city council people. Um, we'll see. All all we can say right now is, though there's a need, uh, obviously, you know, there's there's a problem in how you pay for it. Along with the uh, subcommittee uh, in on transportation, housing, in in, in um, house appropriations, uh, transportation and HUD subcommittee. Part of what they have to address this week is uh, to approve the budget, the president's budget, or uh, to not do so, which they've done in the past. But his current budget called for like a 19% cut to DOT discretionary spending which was the capital investment grant program, uh, reducing funding for Amtrak almost in half, mixing the Tiger program. Those things will be addressed, I guess, tomorrow. Um, so we'll see. Uh, Congress uh, likes Tiger. Uh, we'll see if they can do that. There's been a lot of uh, grumbling about the Tiger grants that were just made because in, in prior Prior years, transit would get like maybe 20% of the Tiger funds. They got 4% of the Tiger funds here in the last uh, three days, um, or that's what's being called for. And um, APTA, for example, is not very happy about that, uh, but uh, it, it's consistent with some of the things we're, we're seeing in terms of the willingness of uh, the White House and the administration to even fund things like the Gateway Project. And, you know, there's huge controversy about the Gateway Project in New York and New Jersey. So we will see on that stuff. Um, reauthorization is the next thing. It's two years out. Um, it's time for us to begin our efforts. Uh, other associations are just beginning theirs as well. Um, but uh, we, we need to start now, try and get this thing squared away within the next three to six months, uh, get our plan in place and begin to push. One of the challenges that we have as an association is uh, because of our, our small numbers, we don't necessarily have the voice that others do, but we have to do things a little smarter than some of the others do. Most of the other associations fall in lockstep and they, and they you know, the, their first thing is money, 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 money. We want money, 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 of course, and we want money too. However, uh, in most cases, we've been more successful um, getting enabling legislation to enable us to take advantage of the money that's already in the system and to amend the rules and so forth to create eligibility, new eligibility for, for our members. And that, that is, I think, the tack that we need to take on this one. The point I made at NLC 
uh, yesterday morning was that uh, mayors, you know, go to the Hill and ask for money. I mean, you know, you need to do that, but recognize that in the FAST Act, uh, because of the 30 plus extensions that, that occurred over the last, uh, you know, three, four, five years on, on funding, and we all know what that was like, that um, there was no policy really put into the bill. The acrimony regarding changes and so forth to MAP 21 was, was such that if, if a lot of the amendments that were proposed uh, would have ruined the bipartisan agreement between uh, Chairman Schuster and Ranking Member DeFazio. And so they approved the funding and uh, we continued essentially with MAP 21 uh, policies and procedures, but uh, FAST Act money. And now we've gone another six years essentially with the same uh, policies and procedures. And of course the transportation world is changing dramatically, uh, whether it's autonomous vehicles, uh, uh, you know, private sector involvement that's being asked for by the White House, things like that. Policies and procedures need to be put in place that enable those things to occur. And today those things don't exist. So my, my point to NLC was this, um, obviously make, make the case for more money, but also don't forget that this bill needs to have policy in it. And that's where we come in. Um, we will be meeting with other associations to talk about what we think uh, will work, uh, but our um, our efforts on reauthorization need to get started. So I'm soliciting volunteers to be on a reauthorization task force. If you would like to participate, I would ask that you email me and volunteer your uh, your interest in participating, and uh, we'll get started. And you can reach me at John J O N three letters dot marts m-a-r-t-z five letters at ehi e-h-i dot com and uh register your interest so that's john marts at ehi dot com no. anything coming up there on the on the screen with questions there casey no uh george clark had just mentioned about doing a roll call which we do have everyone who's on the call right now i have everyone's name um in attendance uh, unless you feel you need to do it john yeah well since we're not having a vote today i don't really see that we need to if you have that i think that's good enough the um, okay. is david on the call today yes he is and i can unmute him and just so anyone else uh if you do have a question throughout this call uh and you want to speak please just raise the hand the hand button next to your name and i can unmute you to speak um and i'll go ahead and do that with david now david you should be on unmuted david not very well at all, no. Can you hear me better now? No. Or can, you hear me, can you hear me better now? Yeah. No, real, hardly real, at all. Real deep gravel throat. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Casey, do you want to, you and I want to fill in here? Uh, yeah. Sorry, David. I, we can't really hear you at all. The legislative fly-in is scheduled for Tuesday, May 5th and Wednesday the 16th. Uh, we're making arrangements uh, for those those activities, uh, meetings and so forth are still in the planning works. Uh, Casey has been doing work soliciting uh, information on hotels. Do you have anything that you wanna to share today or that stuff will be posted on the website? We're going to post some stuff on the website. Uh, I've gotten a few, some uh, good hotel deals. Uh, you know, it's a tough week there, but uh, we've got some hotels and we'll get a couple uh, blocks together so that if those of you flying in um, can all stay together. Uh, like John said, it's 15th and 16th. And uh, per the public policy newsletter that went out yesterday, uh, registration is now open. Um, I know the link was included in that, uh, but we can send a follow up email to all of you as well with the link. Yeah, I make a point here. One of the questions that came up in the in the board meeting Monday was, well, if the infrastructure bill is is on the surface dead, do we, you know, how important is the legislative fly-in? And let me just say that 
the pace of progress here in Washington is extremely slow. And the number of people that you have to convince of your uh, uh, proposals and the measures that you're proposing as an association, it's pretty extensive. I mean, you have uh, upwards of 60 members in the House T&I committee that you need to canvas. And uh, on the Senate side, probably on the order of uh, 30 between the banking and environment, public works and commerce uh, committees. So um, our work's cut out for us and we need that extra time. So uh, whether there will or will not be an infrastructure bill, we don't know yet. Uh, given we have Ryan and Schuster and DeFazio and the White House and uh, the Senate all with differing opinions, this thing could change overnight. Uh, but it really is going to boil down to how they, they choose to fund these things. So once they determine that, things will move very quickly. So my point with this is uh, should, should pe people come on in for the fly-in? Yes, because you don't know if this is a critical time or just a time that you should be here to uh, make the case for your stuff that, that uh, the things that the association uh, wants to do. So I, I would suggest uh, to all of you that have the ability to come in, please do so. Uh, it, if uh, we can schedule it right, it might mean only staying one night here, which it's gonna be a little bit more expensive this year because it's gonna be a very crowded time to be here. The um, infrastructure week and police week are occurring at the same time. So uh, that, that means that uh, things are going to book up fast. So if you have the inclination to do so, I would say uh, go ahead and make your reservation right now, even though you're not sure if you're going to come in and you can always cancel it if you do the reservation in a cancelable way, do it, do it as soon as possible. Um, I'm gonna, sorry to cut you off, Don. We're gonna try and see if we can get David one more time here. David, can you wanna try? I am here. Can you hear me better? Yes, it's a little faint, but we can hear you much better if you All want right. to try to speak a little louder. Gotten rid of my sexy, gravelly voice. All right. Okay, go um, ahead. Yeah, just to add, you know, I think Casey and John have, have uh, mentioned uh, pretty much everything in regards to the fly-in. Uh, as, as was discussed, we are looking at a uh, room block to provide uh, some discount to reduce uh, the costs. Uh, we are trying to keep the rate uh, less than 275. Um, I think it's important for uh, to encourage more folks to attend, even if it is just for for one night. <laughs> if folks have any concerns about or questions about the the room rates, uh, do just uh, uh, give us a, an email. Can't really discuss it on the phone, um, and we are building out the agenda of, of you know an important task where the committee is to really identify its main talking points. Uh, uh, the Hill visits and you know, infrastructure piece and authorization. Important. Something that I would throw out to the committee is: uh, Do we want a to try and have some type of position or response? Uh, from ACT in regards to uh, the UBIT issue uh, and nonprofits. Uh, even if we're unable to potentially make a change at this point in time, uh, do we want to start informing and educating uh, the members of Congress about those impacts uh, on our members? Uh, so that's something I would put out to the committee to, to discuss and, and think about. Um, there would be a goal full of uh, meeting with our new uh, lobbying firm on the first day and really using the afternoon of the first day to uh, kind of meet meet internally as, as ACT uh, to uh, ensure that everyone is briefed and aware of uh, what we're going to be talking about and uh, a chance to meet the new team uh, that will be helping lead our uh, government affairs efforts. Um, and as mentioned, uh, you know, registration is open, so folks are able to uh, go in and, and uh, sign up. Okay. Any any questions come in on the uh, on the screen there, Casey? No, the only one we had previously, and I don't know if it's worth mentioning now, John, is uh, uh, Phil had mentioned about addressing the uh, employee shuttles as part of the 15B. I don't know if you wanted to discuss that at all. 
Um, I'm not prepared to talk about that one. I would suggest we look at doing that in the webinar. Okay. Other than that, no. Again, if anyone has a question, you can type it in the question box or raise your hand. We can unmute you. Uh, just let us know. Okay. But as of now, that I don't have anything else, John. All right. David, last thing, anything you want to say on the procurement? Those, those things are due. So uh, the RFP was distributed. We sent it out to at least 10 firms. It has, uh, I do know of a, a few that have also been, uh, you know, members that have shared it with other firms that they know of. Uh, responses are due back to act by this Friday. Uh, we have heard word from at least three firms that they are planning to submit a response to us. Uh, once, <laughs> once we have those responses back in, they will be shared uh, with the selection committee. Uh, as we mentioned, that it's, uh, John, Diane, Rob, Ed McMaster, and myself, uh, and we'll begin the process of reviewing uh, the, the submittals and uh, potentially conducting the interviews with uh, a couple of the firms uh, and hoping to uh, make a recommendation uh, to the board um, you know, or selection um, in early April, mid-April time frame. Okay, all righty, any, uh, any old business anyone wants to bring up, uh, please register within the, the space. <laughs> this isn't the most wieldy way of doing these things, but uh, please uh, do so if, you're, if you have something on the old business side and we'll, we'll do uh, new business next. Nothing so far. Nothing, any new business? Well, hearing or not seeing none or whatever, I guess uh, since I can't hear all of you, uh, I'll assume that uh, I would receive a, a hearty uh, motion to adjourn the call today in a second, and everyone who would scream "I," which is the normal way. Aye, John. Things. So uh, <laughs> with that, uh, we'll talk to you the next uh, uh, in April uh, at the the, uh, the next. Uh, conference April call Wednesday at 2 p.m. So put that into your calendar. It's every second Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And it will remain yeah. that way through the end of this year and probably for many more years, as I suspect. But we did uh, verify that we would continue to do that. Anyone interested in participating on the reauthorization task force, please email me and uh, we'll get you going. Thank you. Yes, With and that, the next call is April 11th. Very good. Thank you very much, everyone. And we'll talk to you in, uh, in just a few weeks. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.